It is great to see you guys here this morning, and it is particularly great to see you guys this morning because this is the second week of our new study in the Gospel of John. And um, as a Christian, um, not just as a pastor, but, but as a Christian and as a pastor, um, I love this book, and I love particularly uh, the first chapter of this book um, because it is intended and I think successfully teaches us uh, the most important topic we can learn as Christians. Uh, I told you that last week. I said, what I love about the book of John is that it teaches us the most important topic we can ever learn as followers of Jesus Christ. And what is the most important topic we can learn as Christians? It's the, it's the bored Sunday school student answer to every question, right? Jesus. The most important topic we can learn as followers in Jesus Christ that we can gain knowledge about is Jesus himself. Know more about Jesus. And the Gospel of John, written by a disciple of Christ, John the Beloved, does this incredible job of introducing us to who Jesus Christ is. That is the whole intent of the book that he wrote. It was to bring the, the image of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, powerfully to all people. He, as we talked last week, he, he, just, he, he wove the story of Jesus in a way in which the Greeks could grab it, in which the Jews could grab it. He wanted them to understand the depth of who Jesus Christ is. And as a result of his intent, we are blessed today because we can learn about the depths of who Christ is, who he really came to be, and who he calls us to be. We as believers need to know more about Jesus. Um, there, there is no topic more important. There is no topic more powerful. As I referenced last week, in uh, Peter, one of, one of Christ's disciples writes in Second Peter, he makes it really clear that the knowledge of Jesus Christ is the key to Christian living. He says, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through what? Through the knowledge of Jesus who called us. He talks here, and, he, and, and the depth of the claim is, is really huge. For all of us, we face life. And we face life so often in times of struggling. And they said, he has given us, the power of God has given us all we need for life and godliness, all we need to live, all we need to navigate our relationship between our husband and wives, all we need to navigate our relationships with our neighbors and with our coworkers, all we need to navigate loss and a broken heart. Through what? The knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is so fund, found, uh, foundational to all the conversations we have, particularly as we're having a conversation about the book of John. Knowing Jesus Christ, really deeply knowing him, and incorporating the knowledge of him, the gospel of him, what he taught, how he lived, is the key to life, and as Peter says here, even godliness. Paul, Paul makes this same claim as he writes to the Colossians when he encourages them to, to walk in a manner worthy of Christ, and he says, to do that, you need the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So John starts off right away letting us know the nature of his topic right in chapter 1, verse 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him and by him. Right away, he starts out and he says, listen, I want you to understand, the story I'm about to write, the story I'm about to tell you, is not about a normal man. It is about the word who's God. That's foundationally important in our lives as we, as we press into this idea of, I want to live my life. I, I, need, I need the knowledge of Jesus Christ to live my life, to live in godliness. It is foundationally important to us to know Jesus Christ is God. He's not just a good teacher who had some good ideas years ago. 
He, he, he's not just this great prophet who spoke about something else or someone else years ago. Jesus Christ is God, which means he was alive in power then. He died in glory then. He rose in power, and he lives in power now, involved in our lives. See, if he's just some guy who was years ago and he died, most of what he teaches it means that the power of his words rests only in his words. So as we try things, as we figure things out, as we, as we try and live this life the way Jesus, this great teacher, taught, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't work. Who knows? But because he's God, what the Word of God tells me is he's involved in my life. He intervenes in my life. He has the power to influence as I am faithful to his word, as I am faithful to his teaching. He's involved in my life. This is the thing that, that continually in, in the walk I've had with Jesus Christ from the time I was a kid to, to today is me seeing the hand of God doing things that only God does, only that God can do. Uh, we've had the, we've had this stories around here over the last several months of God healing people in in miraculous and unbelievable ways. People who have issues of blood for nine years and somebody laying hands on them, praying for them, and it goes away. Tumors shrinking, headaches gone. People who wanted to commit suicide being set free. Do you know why that is? Because Jesus is God. Because Jesus reigns and rules over all things. And so for me, I can live my life in a way knowing that I serve God. The knowledge of Jesus Christ leads us into a life that is different. And right from the get-go, John is saying, we need to know he's God. Today's text works powerfully again in that direction, pushing us um, to know him even deeper. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, the declaration he makes here is really um, profound. It's really, it's almost stunning in, in, the, in, in his declaration when you really look at it. It says, he is light. It says, he is the light. There's something about that that is, um, is a contrasting declaration, right? It says that he is light and he came into the darkness. Now, darkness and light are contrasting ideas, aren't they? Right? You have light and you have darkness. Have you guys ever seen darkness and light coexist? They, they, they cannot, they, they don't live in the same space, do they? Right? If it's dark and light comes in, dark goes away. That's the definition of this. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a really simple science lesson for you guys, if you haven't learned. You walk in a dark room, light turns on, darkness goes away. So the declaration that, that, that John is making about the entry of Jesus Christ into this world is this contrasting idea. This is light entering darkness. Where the light of him is, darkness doesn't exist. This really is about John making the declaration that in the world there is darkness. Darkness. But Jesus Christ is the light. Jesus Christ is the light that enters into darkness. His, his, John's declaration here is really clear about the contrast between the world and the light of Christ. This, this is about the knowledge of Jesus Christ knowing him, coming to him in the struggle of life. This is about how the, the knowledge of Christ actually works in the hard times of our existence, in the hard times of our life. How many of you are past the years of being taken care of by your parents and have figured out that life is hard? 
Like when you're 16, 17, you think life is a really easy thing, right? But once you start getting into life and you start really experiencing loss, and you really start, start experiencing the pain of what it is to live, life isn't easy. Relationships aren't easy. The limitations of our body aren't easy. The older you get, the, the, the more you realize how fragile your existence is. In this life, and Jesus said this, Jesus said, in this life, you will face many trials. In this life, you will find much trouble. In this life, in this world, there is darkness. In this life, you find pain and heartache and loss. In this life, you find brokenness and sickness and anger and hatred and bigotry. And how we are able to navigate that in light is our knowledge of Jesus Christ, is our understanding of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of Jesus and embracing his life, his teaching, his, his death, his resurrection, his gospel in application every single day. And, and, and here's the thing. Quite often, um, quite often, it goes against logic. The application of Jesus Christ, his love, his peace, his joy, his sacrifice. When we face the struggles of this life, when we face hatred, when we, when we face bigotry, when we face abuse, when we face mistreatment, goes against our logical response to the things of this world. But the truth is that's where we find healing. It's how we find peace. It's how we find hope. It's how we find our own personal value. I mean, think about this. In Jesus Christ, the promise is you will find healing. The promise is you will find peace. The promise is you will find hope. The promise is you will find personal value in your very existence. How many of you have noticed that all of those are in short supply in our society? It's really easy to look around and see how people are grasping to find peace. It doesn't, it, it, it's not hard to find somebody who struggles to find hope in the midst of what's going on in their lives. Suicide is at all-time highs. The, the need for, the, the, the need for, um, for drugs to bring peace and rest into people's lives is at an all-time high. The conflict that we see around us is probably, in my lifetime, at an all-time high. But the promise of Jesus Christ is that you will find peace, that you will find hope, that you will experience true love. Not a broken love that we see happening all the time in this world. The promise is in Jesus Christ, all of this is found. And yet, we don't see that. Why? What's really fascinating to me about John's declaration here is when he says, the light came into the darkness, but they didn't know him, and they didn't receive him. He says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Think about that. I would think when darkness enter or when light enters darkness people would be attracted to it right isn't that isn't that what happens isn't isn't that how things take place when when you are engulfed in darkness and you look out and you see and you see the light 
Where do most people go? They don't go back deeper into the darkness, right? You want to go towards the light. Have, have, you, ever, have you ever thought about how a lighthouse works? Right? A lighthouse is effective because when it's dark, the ships see the light. And they know where to go. They understand it. It cuts through. And they figure out where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. Most people, in their stuck in darkness, if you're a ship stuck in darkness and you see a light, you're not like, oh, we need to, I'm going to go further in the darkness where I can't see that anymore. It's what guides them. It's what, it's what leads them. It's really fascinating when you read this because what it's saying to us is that when the light came in the darkness, the darkness loved the darkness instead of being attracted to light. Jesus came, and he did some really amazing things, didn't he? How many of you would like to have seen, how would you like to have been there when Jesus did the things he did? Right? I mean, lepers healed, blind people healed with mud, dead guys coming out of the ground. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Have you ever realized how many people saw Jesus do what Jesus did and rejected him? For me, I, like, I have these conversations with people on a, on a fairly regular basis where they're like, man, if I could have just been there, if, if I could have just seen Jesus do that, if I could see it today, like, man, if, if I could see God heal somebody, like, miraculously, somebody's blind, and you, and you touch them, and then all of a sudden they begin to see, I would really believe if I could see what Jesus did, how many of you realize a bunch of the people who saw Jesus do what Jesus did screamed for him to be crucified? The, 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 the same people who saw Jesus heal a blind man said he was demon-possessed. The same people who, who saw Jesus rise a dead man from the ground said he's a liar. The light came into the world, but the world didn't receive him. Even in our world today, we see it. I mean, I, I have, I mean as I said, I've, I've, I've been blessed to see God perform miracles. We can, I can show you, we can show you the, 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 the medical reports on these things. It's somebody in our, in our church, seven pound tumor went in to be, to, to be um, removed and they've got the image of it. Somebody prayed for him and they went in and it had shrunk down to the size of a pinky finger. Do you know what happens when you tell people that story who don't believe in Jesus Christ? They still don't believe. They come up with some reason or some idea as to why that couldn't have been truth. Jesus came and did amazing things and people still rejected him. Why? Because lighthouses don't just work because the light shines in the darkness but because the ships know they are in danger. The ship's captains understand that the light is there to save them. That, the, that, that they're in a position where they need saving. Where if they continue on the path that they go on, they're going to run aground. They're going to be shipwrecked. Many in our world don't think they need him. Many think they have it all figured out. Many continue in their religiosity like the Pharisees, and many continue in their hedonism like the Romans, believing that these things will save them. And they won't. The dependency of Christianity exists between legalism and hedonism. And it's a place that many people don't feel they need to dwell. 
They have their hope in something other than Jesus Christ. And the truth is that there are reasons why we, we stubbornly continue to sail toward the rocks where ship upon ship have been dashed, believing that we will be the exception. And at the core of it is that Christianity, following Christ, requires one thing that none of us in our own nature does um, naturally. It's humility and submission. Humbling yourself. Submitting yourself. We in our humanity, the world struggles with following Jesus down that path. Of laying aside, humbling yourself, living in self-sacrifice. It's really clear when you think about the words uh, that John wrote in 1 John. One of the things I love about, about reading the, the, the Gospel of John is as I read the Gospel of John, I can lay it aside, the, 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 the letters of John in 1 John and 2 John, I can lay it aside the, the, the book of Revelation that John wrote. Because you can kind of walk through that and you can kind of get an idea of what he's talking about, about or what he means by these things. The, the greatest way to interpret Scripture is by Scripture. And when you get this author that has written these things, you can, you can see the, the, the thread, especially John, you can see the thread of what he was trying to say. So, so here in John chapter 1, we see John saying, listen, Christ came into the world, the light came into the world, and the world did not know him. Now remember that, the world did not know him. Remember, our whole conversation here is about how we grow in what? The knowledge of Jesus. That we receive the knowledge of Jesus and it transforms us. What he's saying here is the world didn't, re- didn't know Jesus Christ. He didn't re- they didn't receive the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so now you sit there and you go, well, what, what, what defines the world when he says the world? What does he mean by that? Well, what's beautiful is I can jump all the way up to 1 John and I begin to get a, get a, get a greater insight into what John was thinking when he said the world didn't know him. What does he say? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. He is describing here, he is describing here, and I want want you to look at it, he is describing here what the world's values are. What, What defines the world, what drives the world. What the identity of the world is in. And what does he say? The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And what's fascinating about this is as you read this, and, and I take it and I, and I step into my culture, I step into my world, what I realize is he is defining our culture. He's defining how our culture faces life, how we, how we identify, how we look through things, and it is so counter to living out Christ. Why do I say that? The lust of the flesh. At the core of that declaration is the world is driven by their own pleasurable desires. What I want. We live in a culture and society, and and you see this manifest, you see this declaration manifested in this way. We live in a culture and a society that are slaves to sexuality. There is, there is absolutely no way you can look at our world and, and the things that we do and the things that we pursue and the things that are, that are pervasive and not come to the conclusion that we are, live in a society that is a slave to sexuality. 
Do you, do you think there, do, do you think it is by chance that what drives the internet is pornography? Uh, the, 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 top, the top websites by far, forever, on the internet is pornography. Lust of the flesh. We live in a society in which completely giving yourself over to sexuality is reasonable. In fact, it would be offensive to suggest to anyone that you should deny your sexual desires and your sexual wants. And and I want you to understand this. This is in spite of the fact that Jesus Christ taught in Matthew. He makes the declaration about what it is to be followers of Jesus Christ. This is what he says. He says, some men are born eunuch or celibate. Some men are made eunuchs by other men. And some men become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now understand this. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. These are the words of Jesus Christ. This is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What does he say? Our sexual desires and our sexual wants are to be subservient to the teaching of Jesus Christ, to who he is. Because you want to do something that doesn't give you license to do that thing, if you want to live in accordance with Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't, I don't care. Like, that's ultimately what it comes down to for me. And this is why the argument on this whole thing for so often is so stupid to me. Listen, do you want to follow Jesus with everything that's in you? Is he your everything? Is he, is he the one that you follow after and want to follow after? If the answer to that is no, cool, then go do whatever you want. I don't care. But if the answer is, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then when Jesus Christ makes the declaration that your sexuality is subservient to his kingdom, then you have to do that. The second thing he says here is the lust of the eye. When he, what he's saying in here is, is the envying, the, the wanting, the looking at others and saying, they've got that, I need that. They've got that. I want that. Have you ever noticed how much our world is driven by what the other guys got? The resentment we have towards people who have more than us? The the turmoil that takes place inside of us because we got to get there when they've got that there? And yet, all of that, despite the fact that Jesus Christ clearly states clearly makes it, makes it over and over and over again. What profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? He said, it doesn't matter. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. The, the final definition of the world, as he states here, is the pride of life. And this makes the most sense. As John is talking here, he's saying, He's saying it is the clinging to. It is is the desire for this life. It makes all the sense in the world. Because if there is no God, and there is no heaven, all there is, is this life. And so we live in a society in which people are clinging to the things of this life and, and the accomplishment in this place. In spite of the teaching of Jesus Christ saying, do not store up treasures here on earth, but store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt. So the understanding of Jesus Christ is that we live this life not for this life, but we live this life for his glory in anticipation of a greater life. That redefines us that redefines people who live for the sake of Jesus Christ. The world struggles because the world is defined by lust and pride. And Christ leads us 
to sacrificial love, born in humility. And make no mistake, the knowledge of Jesus Christ leads you to a humble life. Jesus lived to sacrifice. Jesus came to die for others. He came to set aside his wants, even set aside his desires. He's the one and said, not my will be done. As he faced the cross, not my will be done, but your will. He let go of his right to restitution and said, Father, forgive them. We in our culture, we in our society, we in our humanity cling to our rights and to the vengeance that we can claim when our rights are violated. But Jesus Christ said, When he went to the cross, when they beat him for doing nothing wrong, he never stood and declared, you are wrong. He said, Father, forgive them. Do we see that manifested in our culture and our society? Do we face injustice in our lives? Say, Lord, it's okay because I don't cling to the pride of life here. I want to live you because my goal is beyond here. He let go of his right to revenge. He laid down his life in humility, fulfilling his identity as Savior, living in humility. Anyone who thinks that isn't true doesn't understand the gospel story. He laid a path before us of humility. Remember the declaration that Paul writes about him in Philippians. By taking the form of a servant. And if you look at the word there, it literally means slave. Being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death. We don't do that well naturally. We don't see our path to self actualization through self denial. We don't see our path to personal fulfillment through personal sacrifice. But that is the call of Christians. The calling of Christians is finding fulfillment in life by being fulfilled in the glory of Christ. That my life isn't about self-actualization, about living my better self, but in glorifying Christ for his sake. And we do that by him, through him not ourselves. That's where this text ultimately leads. How does this become a reality in people's lives? What makes the difference between the world that didn't know him, the people who did not receive him, and those who do? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Next week I'll probably expound on that a little, a little more. But together, in short, I want you to understand the answer here is God empowers us to be his children. He speaks life into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. This isn't something that we're ever going to conjure up. This isn't something in our own humanity we can live out. In fact, one of the the themes of the book of John you'll see over and over and over again is it is God calling, it is God empowering, it is God allowing you to live this path that Jesus Christ leads us to. And that really is an ongoing process in our lives. 
This isn't just him calling us to be children one time. It is him calling us to be children every day of our lives by his strength, by his power, by his glory. It really just requires us to yield to him. It is his image, it is his gospel alive in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. To those who believe, he gave the power to be the children of God. That's why in closing, this passage is powerful, not just for the story recorded 2,000 years ago, but for us today. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. His gospel example, his grace every day, sustains us to live in the humility of Christ instead of the pride of this world. He sustains us. This isn't an easy calling natural to to our, our human state. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived a life as an example to us. He went to the cross and died for us and rose again, sending his Holy Spirit that we might follow after him. This is the light of the world. This is the only light of the world. Aside from him, there is only darkness. And our, and our challenge this morning is to come deeper into the light of God. No matter where you are in your walk, maybe you're here today and you've never received Christ as your personal Savior. You've never given your life fully to him. Or maybe you're here and you've served the Lord your whole life and you found yourself in your Christian walk. It doesn't make any difference where you are. The call is the same. Step deeper into the light of Christ. We are all constantly being called by Jesus Christ to be more like Jesus Christ. And so the question this morning is this. Do you receive the light of Christ? Or do you continue on a walk in the darkness of your own humanity?